Welcome back to another study about false prophets. We have been doing detailed studies on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7 verse 16 reads, By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And in verse 17, Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And in verse 18, A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And in verse 19, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And finally, verse 20. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. We need to be able to identify who a false prophet is. In earlier studies, we have learned that we are not to judge anyone, but we do have to discern false teaching from true teaching. We also learned that since false prophets are wolves in sheep's clothing, it means that they are not true born-again Christians, because they are wolves and not sheep. The symbology in the New Testament is that the sheep are the true disciples of Jesus, while wolves are from the enemy's camp. In an earlier study, we learned that behind every false prophet or false teacher is an evil spirit. Also notice that the wolves are in sheep's clothing. In the Bible, clothing always refers to righteousness. Therefore, the false prophets and false teachers appear to be righteous. They look Christian in their works and service. So what is the fruit that Jesus is talking about? Is it behavior? Is it actions? Is it piety? Or is it the fruit of the Spirit that is love, joy, peace and so on? I believe the answer is none of these. To get the right answer, let's look at the Bible. The Synoptic Gospel of Luke has a similar passage regarding this. In Luke chapter 6, verses 43 to 44, it reads, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bears good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. Indeed, people do not gather figs from thorn bushes or grapes from brambles. This looks like the same example as we have seen in Matthew 7. But let's look at the next verse. In verse 45 it says, The good man brings good things out of the good treasure of his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil treasure of his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Hmm, so the fruit that Jesus is referring to with regards to false prophets is not what we see, Rather, it is what we hear. We will know the fruit of the prophet by what he speaks, not by what he looks like. What comes out of his mouth will reveal who he really is. He may appear righteous in every way, but if deceit and falsehood are in his heart, false teachings and false prophecies and other perversions of the truth will come out of his mouth. Prophecy is both foretelling, as in predicting the future, which is very common in the Old Testament, or forth-telling or speaking forth the word of God. So any perversion of the truth of God is a kind of false prophecy. So bad fruit is a perversion of the truth. It is not something we see, but it's something we hear. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 to 34, Jesus explains, Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. Reiterating the importance of speaking the truth. And further on in verses 35 to 37 it says, The good man brings good things out of his good store of treasure and the evil man brings evil things out of his evil store of treasure. But I tell you that men will give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. It is not the fruit of service or the fruit of our conduct Jesus is referring to, the fruit of the mouth and the fruit of the lips. 
This thought is taken by James when he wrote in chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. But no man can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. And in verses 11 to 12, Can both fresh water and bitter water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree grow olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Notice how James is connecting the thought of wrong fruit regarding what the mouth does, which is in regards to speaking and hearing. It is not about seeing the truth. In other words, in the Bible, the truth cannot be seen but it can be heard and discerned. Speaking the truth about his word is very important to God. Let's read Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 25 to 27. I have heard the sayings of the prophets who prophesy lies in my name. I had a dream, I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these prophets who prophesy falsehood, these prophets of the delusion of their own minds? They suppose the dreams that they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their fathers forgot my name through the worship of Baal. And in verses 28 to 30, Let the prophet who has a dream retell it, but let him who has my words speak it truthfully. For what is straw compared to grain, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that smashes a rock? Therefore, behold, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from each other words they attribute to me. And in verses 31 and 32. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues and proclaim. The Lord declares it. Indeed, declares the Lord, I am against those who prophesy false dreams. They tell to lead my people astray with their reckless lies. It is not I who sent or commanded them, and they are of no benefit at all to these people, declares the Lord. There is clearly a strong judgment for false preachers of the truth, especially the gospel, as seen in Galatians chapter 1 verses 8 and 9. For even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be under a divine curse. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you embrace, let him be under a divine curse. Another example in the Old Testament about false prophets is given in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 20 to 22. But if any prophet dares to speak a message in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or to speak in the name of other gods, that prophet must be put to death. You may ask in your heart, how can we recognize a message that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speak in the name of the Lord and the message does not come to pass or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Notice again, the error is not about what they do, but it's related to what they say. The early church fathers understood this as can be seen in some of their teachings. In Didache, chapter 11, it says, Whosoever therefore shall come and teach you all these things that have been said before, receive him. But if the teacher himself be perverted and teach a different doctrine to the destruction thereof, hear him not. And Pseudo Ignatius wrote in the epistle to Hero the deacon in chapter 2, Everyone that teaches anything beyond what is commanded, Though he be deemed worthy of credit, though he be in the habit of fasting, though he be in continence, though he work miracles, though he have the gift of prophecy, let him be in thy sight as a wolf in sheep's clothing. So to identify a false prophet, we need to listen to what he says, not watch what he does. But to do that, we first need to study the truth to be able to discern. Don't judge people by what they do. Learn to discern the truth by listening to what they say. In Acts chapter 17 verse 11, it clearly says, 
Now the Berians were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if these teachings were true. To understand this further, let's explore a, a little bit of botany and agriculture. The purpose of the fruit is to provide food and nourishment to the one that eats it. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 9, it says, Out of the ground the Lord God gave growth to every tree that is pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in verse 16, it says, And the Lord commanded him, You may eat freely from every tree of the garden. But the purpose of the fruit is not only to provide food, but to propagate life. And it does this by the seed that is not seen from the outside. A seed is small and lifeless within a fruit, but it has the capacity to create more fruit and hence more life. Notice the intention of the fruits as mentioned in Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth vegetation, seed-bearing plants and fruit trees, each bearing fruit with seed according to its kind. And it was so. A false teacher, a wolf, can seemingly have good fruit on the outside. We need to see the inside, the seed. So what is the seed in the Bible a picture of? Jesus gives us the answer when explaining the parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8 verse 11. Now this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. A good fruit will produce good seed. Good seed is the word of God which will produce life. In contrast, a bad fruit will produce bad seed and will produce death. And since this is a cycle, a good seed will produce good fruit, while a bad seed will produce bad fruit. This can be clearly seen by the difference between the two trees in the Garden of Eden. One is a good tree, the tree of life, representing the true gospel. The other is the bad tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, representing the false gospel. We will study more about seeds, trees and fruits in a later study. For now, let us remember, we need to trust our ears for discernment, because our eyes may not always tell the truth. Be vigilant, be students of the word, and be blessed. Thank you.